Thank you for inviting me to speak this evening. Uh, my talk tonight comes out of a lifelong connection to parks and other green spaces on this side of London. And over that time, my interest in them and their history has grown. And I've begun to look at how they came to survive the onslaught of London's development over the past couple of centuries. Um, and this talk, I hope, connects somewhat to Laurie's fascinating um, a presentation on uh, the Lee Valley in the last, uh, last talk, in highlighting the tensions that occurred over the uses of open spaces in urban environments. So please feel free to type any questions you have uh, as we go along. This is the story of ordinary Londoners and the part they played in the preservation of open spaces. It's not the story of elite campaigners in Parliament and the law courts, but the ways that ordinary Londoners have used their green spaces, the way that they've thought about them, and how they've helped to save them from development. The usual story told about the rescue of London open spaces starts with people like this. Middle class campaigners, um, from left to right here, we've got Octavia Hill, Sir Robert Hunter, and Canon Hardwick Rawnsley all of whom went on to found the National Trust in the 1890s. And the first two, Octavia Hill and Robert Hunter in the centre there, uh, were involved from the early 1860s in the preservation campaigns for London through organisations like the Commons Preservation Society. And it's accounts from them and others like them of the saving of common land uh, in and near London, which have historians drawn for their own histories. Much less is known is the story of ordinary Londoners and their part in the saving of London's open spaces. Uh, reasons for this may be because working class people have left very few written records. So what they thought and did always um, appears from somebody else's perspective. Um, the middle classes saw those below them in Victorian London as alternately comical or threatening. Um, and the reputation in East London in particular in the 19th century falls into the latter category. Writers described it like it was a foreign country that they were visiting. In books, articles and pamphlets, such as The Bitter Cry of Outcast London, published in 1885, East London was described as the sink into which the filthy and abominable from all parts of the country seemed to flow. So not very promising for East London there. But the reality was much more complicated. Some parts of East London, especially the inner East End, certainly did um, experience appalling conditions of poverty. Others like Hackney here in this slide, um, showing Conduit Place in the late 19th century, were much more mixed in terms of housing and income. Many working class Londoners in the mid-Victorian period began to earn more money and were able to um, move out of the inner city um, and come to places like Hackney. Many also were migrants from the countryside and they never lost their desire for connection to open spaces. Um, you can see here on the, uh, above the door of the first house, for example, um, caged birds, probably from Epping Forest, in fact, just up the road. And above uh, on the first floor windows are window boxes. Some others had small gardens, like these behind Weaver's Cottages in Bethnal Green in the 1860s but these were soon swept away by housing development. So working men were buying or renting plots ever further east uh, in the suburbs of East London. And the reason they were doing this was, uh, was because of the growth of London. Up to the early 19th century, London's growth was slow. It was still small by 1800. And uh, Londoners of Shakespeare's time would probably still have recognized the city um, as it was at the beginning of the 19th century. Um, uh, in Shakespeare's London, there were about 200,000 people, which had doubled perhaps a little more by the end of the 17th century, shown in blue here. And by 1800, shown in mauve, London was still fairly confined, although the population had reached about a million. But then we saw extraordinary growth of London between 1800 and 1914, um, up to seven million by the eve the First World War. And villages around London became towns and then suburbs but as people moved out of the inner city or migrated in from the country to work in industries along the River Lee, 
and in other parts of the East End. Here's Bryant and May, a bigger employer, uh, who opened their factory at Bow in 1861. And the city became ever more crowded. And so many of the better off began to move out of London to live in villages which had easy connections to the centre. Um, William Morris's father, who lived in Walthamstow, commuted into the city for his job um, and lived, actually he didn't live in this house, the Morris family moved here after he died around 1848. Um, but this is fairly typical of an affluent um, upper middle class Londoner's village abode. By the 18th century, villages like Hackney had grown into sm desirable small towns on the fringes of London. Um, and Dr. Johnson was to say of Hackney, the greatest ambition of the London shopkeeper was to retire to Stratford or, and, or Hackney. And with a population of several thousand, Hackney had coffee houses, bowling greens, assembly rooms and taverns to offer its new inhabitants. But it wasn't only the middle classes who were moving out. Uh, working class Londoners also came to Hackney. They also wanted more space and, and moved to these expanding suburban, well, villages becoming towns. Here is Well Street at the end of the 19th century. And the sp suburban spread went further. The working classes of London were increasingly inspiring to own or rent property on the fringes of London. And here is Forest Gate. Um, and we can see here the edge of Wanstead Platts the southern border of Epping Forest. Um, and this picture illustrates the tension um, between open space and development. While the urchins sort of lark larking about in the pond in the foreground, behind them, uh, new terraces of houses are being run up at speed. Um, and this was not, this was happening all over London. This not only in the east of the city. Um, here is Wandsworth Common towards the end of the 19th century. All the London commons were highly desirable open spaces. And as you can see here, many local newspapers advertise the charms of living, living alongside them. That's Wandsworth. Here is Hackney in the, again, the late 19th century, the, the newspapers advertising handsome villages overlooking the Downs. And land on the edge of London was beginning to be put to multiple uses. Here is Morning Lane in Hackney in the early 19th century. Uh, Hackney had very pure water at that time, um, unbelievably, and it made it the watercress centre of London in the 19th century. And you can see the watercress beds on the right here, but also brick clay was sought after and many commons and other open spaces were increasingly being degraded by brickworks digging for clay and gravel. And you can see here brickworks on the left. And as this is a quote from Dickens, um, as he said, these places were neither of the town, town nor the country. Tumble down fences, places where the dusty nettles are growing, where a scrap or two of hedge may be seen. But despite all this, the open spaces of, of the edge of London were hugely popular with ordinary city dwellers. The commons were called London's lungs. And here is Hampstead Heath on a bank holiday Monday. Not only bank holidays, but uh, from the 1860s onwards, after the introduction of the Saturday half holiday on Sundays and what was called St Monday by Londoners, an unofficial extra day off for many of them. Visitors to all of London's open spaces came in their thousands and sometimes in their hundreds of thousands. To meet the growing demand for open space in East London, Victoria Park opened in the 1840s and it was very popular with Londoners from the start. But as you can see here, it was a highly regulated space with fences and park keepers to keep the humbler classes in order. The London commons were attractive because they were not controlled, um, like Victoria Park. Epping Forest, for example, was just outside the Metropolitan Police District, um, and it was the centre of attraction for uh, many throughout the 19th century to come to events like the Fairlock Fair, an annual event every summer, which began in the, seven, in the 18th century when shipyard workers from Wapping came out to a party um, under the Fairlop Oak, which you can see in the background there. And it grew into a major annual event for East Londoners. Um, and you can see why. If you look on the, it, the, the uh, front left of this picture, you can see a, a kettle being boiled over an open fire. 
something which would be completely out of place and, un and not allowed in Victoria Park. Also, the Epping Hunt was a great attraction to Epping for Epping Forest. On Easter Monday each year, thousands of East Londoners attended, and it was almost like Derby Day for them. Um, and again, like the Fairlock Fair events, it continued right into the late 19th century. It's much satirised by London newspapers and cartoonists who ridiculed uh, Cockney attempts to ride hunting horses. The arrival of the railways made London's rural fringes much easier of access, and here's Hackney Station on the North London Railway, which was opened in 1870. And what the railways meant was that Londoners could begin to live beyond their uh, walking distance to work, so that they could, uh, so that the railways were used not just by professional classes to commute, but also working people, especially after the introduction of the cheap early morning trains. One, one arriving at Liverpool Street here. So it meant that East Londoners could consider uh, living on the fringes of London and commuting in just like their middle class peers. But open spaces were not just about leisure. They were also important to ordinary Londoners as meeting places where politics could be aired. And a great tradition throughout the 19th century in London was that of the open air protest meeting. And here is one of the most famous the Chartist demonstration of 1848 on Kennington Common. The Charter called for fairly mild reforms as we would consider them today. Votes for, well, men over the age of 21, the secret ballot, annual parliaments and so on. Um, and so, uh, but, so not in our terms very radical, but they were seen as hugely threatening by the authorities. And Chartist meetings were banned from pubs and um, indoor halls all over London. Because they were banned from indoor spaces, uh, the Chartists met in the open air. And here's a meeting at Whips Cross, Walthamstow, one of the first recorded political meetings on Epping Forest land, by no means the last. Um, I'm indebted to James Diamond's excellent People's History of Walthamstow for, um, for publishing this uh, this image originally. But open air uh, political meetings, as I say, frightened the authorities and made them more determined to control these open spaces. Uh, places like Kennington Common were turned into parks uh, mid century. Kennington Common became a park in 1854. Another great open air tradition was the election. Um, even though um, only a minority had the vote, non-electors were still recognized and courted by politicians who knew that they could have an impact at the hustings. These are open air meetings of electors and non-electors where before the introduction of the secret ballot, head counts were taken um, for the vote. So, and you can see the impossibility um, of counting uh, who had the vote and who did not um, in a situation like this one. This is a husting in Lambeth in 18 mid 1850s and often non-electors got counted into results. So whether it was for political protest or leisure, the open spaces in and around London were a constant attraction for all. Um, out outings in holiday vans were popular throughout the Victorian period and here's one leaving for Epping Forest um, in the 1850s. But just as working people could begin to enjoy open spaces in London, development began to endanger them, particularly from mid-century. Epping Forest became one focus of people's attention. Once a remote rural spot, as we've seen by the mid 19th century, um, it um, was really on the borders of London. And local landowners were beginning to see the opportunity to enclose the forest and sell it off for building land. Um, and many influential voices were raised uh, uh, in protest like Charles Dickens here in his magazine, Household Words in 1851, talking about the extension of the wilderness of bricks and mortar, meaning that we need to take more care of the wilderness beyond. But protests against uh, London Commons enclosures reached a peak uh, in the mid-Victorian period, the late 1860s, the early 1870s, and Epping Forest became symbolic of many of the issues. A much loved and heavily used open space, the threat of building development hanging over it, 
and aristocratic land, landowners like this one, uh, Viscount Cowley, Lord of the Manor of Wanstead. Um, and people like Cowley became um, targets of increasing hostility throughout this period. This is a quote from Reynolds's newspaper, which is the most popular radical paper, huge, uh, hugely widely read by working class readership. And Reynolds's didn't pull its punches when it was describing people like Cowley. Um, oppressive, tyrannical, selfish, and rapacious. And whenever um, those words are used, a nobleman is certain to figure somewhere um, in, uh, in, the, in, in the story. Do remember um, to type any questions you have into the chat and I will try to answer them at the end. A word of explanation here um, is needed regarding what common land meant. The lords of the manor owned the soil of the commons though, and thought they had absolute property rights, but ordinary people uh, also considered that they had rights. They had rights to graze cattle on the common, to take firewood and, um, and other materials from the common, and increasingly they claimed they had the right to roam over these common lands. Um, and uh, so this is why local landowners became the target for so much hostility. And the dangers of losing London's open spaces continue to be highlighted in the press. And in the, uh, the key summer of 1871, this cartoon appeared in the popular weekly paper, the Penny Illustrated newspaper. It shows a picnic party in Epping Forest um, being threatened as a woodsman fells a nearby tree labelled Rights of the People. Surveying scene, the background is the Lord of the Manor, and next to him a sign with Crown Lands spelled out on it in large letters, because in Epping Forest the Crown had rights of its own. Meanwhile, in the foreground, we see John Ball in his top hat, vainly trying to awaken uh, a policeman who's fast asleep. And the message about greedy landowners stealing the people's land while the law took no action, very clear. So 1871 was a high point for demonstrations against forest enclosures. A series of meetings took place across East London in the summer of 1871, culminating in a great demonstration on Wanstead Flats in July that year. And the gentlemen leaders of the demonstration turned up, made their speeches, appealed to the crowd not to take illegal action, and then they went home. Um, and later that evening, after the police had also departed, uh, the crowd attacked and broke down Cowley's enclosure fences. And this protest continued throughout the early 1870s uh, and spilled over into parliamentary uh, processes because po local politicians were beginning to realise that after the 1867 extension of the vote, popular opinion was playing a significant role um, in um, deciding the vote locally in local elections. So local politicians understood the importance of reaching out to the electorate in East London, many of whom had the vote for the first time. And this advertisement was placed in the East London Observer during the general election of January 1874 by the campaigning group, the Forest Fund. These two London constituencies, uh, Hackney and Tower Hamlets, were fiercely contested in the 1874 election by both radicals and conservatives. Um, and no candidate, either from the Liberal Party or the Conservatives, the key uh, parties taking part in the election, no candidate failed to claim credit for preserving open spaces around London, and especially um, Epping Forest. And here on the left is Henry Fawcett, the blind MP, who was a well-known open spaces campaigner who won one of the two Hackney seats um, very easily, while his um, counterpart in Tower Hamlets, um, the Liberal Acton Ayrton, who was a cabinet minister in Gladstone government and who was widely blamed for the threats that were hanging over Epping Forest for taking no action, was heavily defeated for the first time by a Conservative, the first Conservative to be, conservative to be elected in East London. Meanwhile, uh, the City of London Corporation had stepped in after the Wanstead Flats demonstration. They saw an opportunity to position themselves as the people's champions. It has to be said the City Corporation was not popular with most Londoners who saw them 
as a corrupt and undemocratic elite. So the City of London saw an opportunity to bring a legal case against the Lords of the Manor in Epping Forest to stop the fencing of forest land. The City of London was um, a commoner in Epping Forest because they bought Epping Forest land for their City of London cemetery. And so the legal case they were brought was as commoners to stop the Lords of the Manor um, enclosing large sections of the forest. The case dragged on for three years and eventually the judgment was handed down in 1874 by this man, Sir George Jessel. Um, and you can see it's a damning indictment of the Lords of the Manor. He said here, they've taken other people's property, appropriated it to their own use, made up false evidence, which must be wholly uh, discredited. And this at a time when rights of property were considered to be paramount. But we must see it in the context of the times. There was huge popular outrage for what was seen as stealing public rights. And this is what Jessel and the courts and parliament were, um, were answering to. After the 1874 judgment, the city of London can, be, began to buy up forest land from the lords of the manor um, and opening, reopening it to the public. And this culminated in 1874 with a historic act. I think it's hard to overstate the importance of the Epping Forest Act in 1878. It was the first declaration of a right for the public to use an open space for recreation and enjoyment. Um, and it says here that the Conservatives, the, uh, that's the uh, City of London, should at all times keep Epping Forest as an open space for the recreation and enjoyment of the public um, and resist all further enclosures, encroachments and building. And the campaign for Epping Forest has been called the beginning of the modern conservation movement in Britain. And it's hard to argue with that um, opinion. But other London commons at the same time were coming under similar pressure as Epping Forest. Um, in South London on Wandsworth Common, railway companies had cut up the common in the 1860s um, uh, by laying lines and selling off surplus land to local builders. Um, and it evoked another campaign there. And as you can see, um, direct action was uh, advocated from the start, right at the bottom the, um, the slogan, down with the fences. And, and this campaign was asking people, will you allow bankrupt and speculating builders, um, land societies, beer shopkeepers, rail companies, tailors, um, and noble laws to rob you and your children of their common rights and pass without giving up, without a struggle? Um, and the answer was no, they would not. And the struggle, continued on Wandsworth Common until that was uh, turned into a, a public space uh, by an Act of Parliament in the late 1870s. Meanwhile, across South London in Plumstead, uh, people were fighting their own battle for the common. Um, here is Plumstead Common towards the end of the 19th century. Uh, you can see housing lapping up right up to the edge of the open space. And uh, people were, uh, um, beginning to feel their common open space was being threatened by development. And this man, John de Morgan, stepped into the fray at this point. He's a forgotten figure now, but John de Morgan in the 1870s was probably one of the leading radical politicians of his day. Um, he never uh, um, served in Parliament, um, but he was a, a leading advocate of direct action uh, over open spaces. He was the founder of the Commons Protection League, which is a more militant alternative to the res respectable Commons Preservation Society, which the gentlemen campaigners were members of. The dispute in Plumstead was over the right of the Lord of the Manor, in this case, uh, an Oxford College, to sell off the Commons of various parties, including local businessmen and the army. Um, and despite a legal judgment against enclosures of the common in 1871, um, uh, enclosures by local builders continued. And in 1876, John de Morgan called for action. Um, and the result was three days of demonstrations and fence breaking in July of 1876. Sadly, this is the only photo we have of a commons demonstration in the 19th century. It's not a very clear one. Um, 
but it does show the occupation of the hillside of Plumstead Common um, by the protesters. On the third day of the riot, the riot act was read, troops were put on standby. Uh, De Morgan was arrested along with others. He was sent to prison for a month, um, but released early owing to public pressure uh, to great rejoicing. And Plumstead Common eventually was, um, by act of parliament, uh, made a public open space in the late 1870s. De Morgan also turned his attention to Hackney, where he confronted this man, the local lord of the manor, um, William Tyson Amherst, first Baron Amherst of Hackney. Amherst's aim as the lord of the manor was to maximise the value from what he considered to he be his property. And so Hackney Downs was one of his targets. Um, and his agents um, enclosed, fenced off much of, the, of Hackney Downs for uh, gravel digging. But gravel was very lucrative um, because it was highly in demand for building and road repairs at the time. Um, pits and fencing began to cover Hackney Downs and the Hackney Gazette declared Downs are in the hands of the spoiler. We don't have a contemporary image of the gravel pits on Hackney Downs, um, uh, but this is Wanstead Flats about 1900, uh, um, at the end of a period when the flats had been dug over by um, a brickworks and gravel pits. And you can see how damaging, how degrading that was. So we can imagine that Hackney Downs was in a similar condition. Uh, De Morgan's uh, protest, um, the Commons Protection League stepped in to organise meeting on Hackney Downs um, and um, the newspapers covered two meetings. Here the top uh, meeting was, the, the top uh, article refers to a meeting where fences were demolished and burned, um, uh, the fences that were put up to, to protect the gravel pits. Um, the newspapers described this as a riot, um, but they also referred in the lower article to Amherst's encroachment on Hackney Downs. So the newspapers were playing both sides of the line really. They didn't approve of riotous demonstrators, but they also did not approve of Amherst's actions. But Amherst was not the only um, or, uh, person interested in Hackney Downs. Um, also the, the grocer's company also claimed rights over the Downs and erected fencing um, in 1877 over part of the Downs near to their school buildings here. And so in June of that year, De Morgan let it, led a crowd into the uh, grocer's company enclosure and symbolically destroyed a notice board warning against trespassing. The struggles over Hackney Downs continued but, and were finally resolved um, in the early 1880s when uh, um, Tyson Amherst sold his manorial rights um, to the Metropolitan Board of Works, which is one of the precursors of the London County Council. Um, and the uh, Downs were opened as a public park in 1884. So the Downs were saved, but many were disappointed like, uh, that like other London's uh, commons, they'd been, as the Victorians would have said, parkified with gravel paths and fences. So respectability had set in. The struggles over open spaces continued to flare up everywhere um, in London, uh, including Hackney. And in the 1880s, a long battle was fought over Clapton Pond for, to prevent it being filled in and built on. And in the autumn of 1896, um, this, I particularly like this one, the Golf Club War broke out um, in uh, Honor Oak, which is on the borders of Camberwell and Lewisham. Um, one Tree Hill in Honor Oak was enclosed by a golf club, club um, and this led to protest and two huge demonstrations. At the first um, protest, a groundsman's house was attacked. Um, he was unpopular because he'd set to, uh, his dogs on boys that had been trespassing on the golf course. At the second demonstration, it was estimated that 50,000 were present. This might, may be an exaggeration. And 500 police um, were also there. The crowd stoned the police. They set fire to gorse on the hill. The hill was soon covered by a disorderly multitude, said the local press. Um, but again, a long struggle ended successfully because the London County Council uh, um, made a, a compulsory purchase order in 1904. And this is still an open space today with great views across London. Um, 
and the golf club still has little space on, on our oak on One Tree Hill. London's green spaces continue to be a destination for uh, Londoners' entertainment right through into the 20th century. We can see the popularity of cycling here um, in the early 1900s. And this is Epping Forest, the Robin Hood pub um, on, on the Epping Road, great meeting place. Um, and you can see here also in the middle, um, a wagon and horses bringing out um, uh, a party from London for a day out in the country. London Transport and the railway companies in the interwar years promoted rambles in the forest and other London open spaces. And I've included this because these signs at Epping Forest ac access points have recently been installed, but they're based on a poster design from the 1930s by the local East London artist and teacher, Walter Spradbury. Um, he said he felt himself lucky to be able to produce work portraying the joys of the open air. By the late 1930s, London's open spaces were under pressure again. First of all, they were pressed into service for air raids like this one um, on, on Hackney Downs, an uh, air raid shelter being built in 1938. And into the war years, as huge damage was done across London by bombing, especially in the East End, and thousands were made homeless. Um, this is Cundy Street in uh, Silvertown near the docks. Uh, there was a housing crisis in London. Incidentally, I, I like the idea that after all the destruction here in Cundy Street, the ARP warden is guarding the wardrobe, the chest of drawers standing, the only thing left from those houses, presumably. Some uh, of those bombed out um, in the East End were rehoused in accommodation built on Epping Forest, such as these prefabs built by East Ham Council on Wanstead Flats in 1944. The housing shortage continued after the war and East and West Ham councils both had plans to build uh, new towns on forest land. Wasted Flats was their favoured spot and this caused a huge local uproar. And you can see from this cartoon from a local newspaper what the mood was. The councils were accused of acting like the Nazis, which in 1946 uh, was a huge accusation. This cartoon is labelled Invasion 1946, showing building on Epic on Forest land. So a local campaign was organised and collected about 60,000 signatures when it went um, nationwide um, on a petition uh, which was uh, gathered through publicity like this, Hands Off the Forest. This, this um, uh, leaflet is interesting because it harks back to the uh, campaigns of the 1870s. Um, and it talks about uh, the fact that, um, that the, the urban planners were talking, were um, looking at, gri at a green belt round London, uh, which is completely at odds with the uh, policy of East Town Council and West Ham. The decision on whether to build the new town went to a public inquiry held at Stratford Town Hall, and the proposal was at, at length rejected by the ministry on the grounds that insufficient building materials were available. Um, to build the new town. And this sounds a bit like a fig leaf from a Labour government uh, to protect two Labour councils, but also because um, much bigger schemes like the Abercrombie plan um, for Greater London, which Laurie talked about last time, was earmarking new towns like Harlow for development for housing East Londoners. And the open spaces protests have continued. Um, here is the 1990s M11 link protest at Wanstead, and I'm sure some people listening to this tonight will remember this campaign. Um, and it focused um, um, at one point around the removal of a tree on George Green in Wanstead, uh, which is uh, um, an op a common open space. Um, and it attracted the attention of the national media when the protesters uh, registered this tree as a residential address. And the uh, national press took great delight in taking photographs of postmen delivering mail to the tree. And um, activity peaked in the mid 1990s with several high profile protesters setting up independent states um, in property scheduled for demolition, notably in Claremont Road in Leighton. And although the road was eventually built in, and opened in 1999, the costs of policing protesters 
and the raising the profile of campaigns like this in the UK did seem to have contribute to, to contributed to a slowing down of, uh, of uh, the enthusiasm for road schemes. So I'll leave you um, at the end of this talk with this view of Hackney Downs and um, a quotation from a radical MP, uh, Francis Atwood, um, who spoke in Parliament in 1834. And I hope this story tonight has indicated um, the continuity of the need to heed um, Francis Atwood's words. He said, by the ancient laws, the people of this country had the right of wandering through the green fields at leisure. I wish those old laws were restored, for we cannot be too cautious in our interference with the amusements and enjoyments of the people. And I put this on the background of that wonderful wildflower meadow on Hackney Downs. If anybody wants to read any more um, of this story, uh, my book, um, Saving the People's Forest, is being published by the University of Hertfordshire Press in a couple of months' time. And with that, I'll say thank you and close my presentation, but I'll come back in a few moments to answer any questions.